Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Denise Windenberg. I'm the Director of Research Operations and Effectiveness here at the Foundation, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Steen. So Dr. Steen is a scientist, cardiologist, and entrepreneur. He trained with the Timmy Group out of Harvard University and was one of the last trained under Dr. Eugene Bronwald. He's also Director of Clinical Trials and Population Health Research in the Division of Cardiovascular Health and Disease at the University of Cincinnati of College of Medicine. He's also here with the account ma manager, Sarah Ford, who is account manager of High Enroll that you, you will hear more about. He and his colleagues have focused on designing and validating new models of ambulatory healthcare in unique partnership with the Kroger Company. In this century, retail and other less traditional healthcare industries will become critical to addressing existing global challenges in healthcare access, convenience, effectiveness, and equity. The first trial in this partnership named SuperWin was published in the Nature Medicine and is now considered the premier clinical research trial in research-based healthcare research. SuperWin has received attention from the US White House as well as international media. SuperWin and larger funded trials stemming from this work are expected to be highly influential in the future evolution of the global retail healthcare industry. Dr. Steen is also focused on big data research to understand the improvement treatment understand and improve treatment for cardiovascular diseases. His work has demonstrated gaps in treatment for heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes, both in the US and globally. This research has been used in development of clinical practice guidelines and has been covered internationally, included on the front page of the London Times. He and his colleagues have further developed prediction models and a better understanding of future risk of specific adverse cardiovascular outcomes. I know Dr. Steen through his entrepreneurial spirit. He is the CEO and co-founder of High Enroll, a software startup addressing the global problem of slow and expensive, expensive participation in clinical research studies. During his postdoctoral training with the Timmy Group at the Harvard Medical School, he developed an understanding of the enormous magnitude and scope of the problem for pharmaceutical companies, device companies, regulators, healthcare systems, patients, and the broader public. As an example, difficulty in participant enrollment has been the largest obstacle to understanding many diseases as well as their treatments. High Enroll was founded to develop a first-of-its-kind versatile platform, which is app-based, to address these challenges globally. High Enroll has partnerships with not only industry, large academic research organizations, but also research sites like us here at the foundation. Lisa Tendall and I are very excited to bring High Enroll to MHIF investigators and clinical partners to increase visibility and access to our active enrolling clinical trials to address this need. So join me in welcoming Dr. Steen, who will present today on opportunities for patient-centric cardiovascular healthcare through retail and non-traditional industries. Welcome, Dr. Steen. Thank you. Can everyone hear me well, or do I need this? Okay, perfect. All right, this is a so uh, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been great working with uh, Lisa Tindell, Denise Windenberg, Russ. It's nice to see you. Um, so it's been really great working with the Minneapolis team now for see, almost a year. Is that right? Yeah, it's been great. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work that I've been doing. And I don't know if there are any fellows, trainees in the room, but the germ of this idea popped into my brain when I was doing my research training. And so hopefully it's a demonstration that if you have an idea, you can chase it. It can take a lot of work, but you can chase it and you can put something into motion that, that, that you think is a good idea for the world. So my disclosures, uh, I consult for a couple uh, companies, obviously High Enroll is mentioned, and then the Kroger Company. If you don't know the Kroger Company, they're the nation's largest supermarket. Uh, they may soon ac uh, acquire Albertsons and be much, much bigger with over 5,000 stores, over 4,000 pharmacies. And these are the topics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of observing the pharmaceutical industry and then thinking a little bit about other industries where, and where opportunities were. And I'm talking about sort of the 2011 through 2015 era. And then what I did sort of afterwards in terms of choosing a retailer, choosing a strategy to begin to sort of do research-related work with, the, with a retailer. I'll tell you a little bit about SuperWin, which was mentioned in the introduction, thank you. Uh, a little bit about what's happening now afterwards, and then just some final thoughts, including 
an opportunity that exists in your own backyard that I would love to see come to fruition. So let's, let's tackle the first part. So just to sort of take a step back, I mean, conceptually, we are here today in many ways um, because of this amazing collaboration that now exists between the global you know, pharmaceutical medical device industry and, and academia. It wasn't always this way. 100 years ago, 110 years ago, we didn't really have any drugs, didn't really have any devices. Doctors essentially wandered around hospitals looking for one of about 10 things that they could actually fix. Um, and there certainly wasn't much in the research space. So, but this is a quick example. I mean, this is one of the more important trials that came out of the Timmy study group. It was called Prove It, Timmy 22. You can see here, this was the trial. It looked at intensive stat lowering versus moderate intensive stat lowering. And you can see there the curve split. Um, and now we use a Torva 80 quite frequently. Um, led to a high profile publication because it was done very, very well. And now it's part of guidelines. You've heard this story a thousand times. We're, we're, we're really, really used to it, right? You have to do a great study. You have to publish it with high levels of scientific integrity. And if you do enough of this, you can actually get into guidelines. So this is something that is new in the last 100 years, but has, has become really, really important. So how did this actually happen that we got to a place where we're doing studies like Prove It, Timmy 22? Well, pharmaceutical industry made a massive shift about 100 years ago. It wasn't... None of this existed before. There were people like George Merck who really asked themselves, what is our business and how are we going to do better at this business? And they realized, if you go back even further, I mean, companies were selling bottles of elixirs with you know, labels that would say this would cure tired blood or whatever else it would be, but there wasn't much behind it. These companies at that time really made a massive pivot, and the pivot was to invest in R&D. Sounds simple now. We all take it for granted that, our, that these companies are investing in R&D to hire top quality scientists. That's also something that was new. And then to start collaborating. You all are a fantastic trials institution, are working with industry constantly across a whole range of companies, across a whole range of areas. By that time, this was new. And, and I look at it as really the start of this machinery that allowed all these new drugs, devices, everything that we use in our care today to be developed. So what's needed now, what I tell you that story is, I think we have to ignite this same machinery in new industries. The problems of today, inadequate screening rates, improving dietary adherence. I don't know if you just heard, there are now one billion obese people on the planet, one billion. It's not slowing down either. Um, how do we get people to take their medicines? Medication adherence is abysmal. I've done a lot of work on it. Not clear that we've done anything to improve it. How do we monitor people in an aging population and keep them independent at home? How do we take burned out patients and make their lives easier as, as their care programs become more and more complex? We are going to need new industries. Pharma is not going to solve that. Medical device companies aren't going to solve that. We need new entrants into this space. We have to promote access, convenience, engagement, and effectiveness. And we have to study it in the same way we've been doing with pharma and device companies. So I started looking at the grocery and supermarket industry. And what's interesting about them is um, it's a highly competitive industry, very, very low margin, which means that while they bring in a lot of revenue, their costs are also enormous. The net operating profit margin is around 1.4%. Uh, and very slow growth uh, market. They are constantly looking at ways to increase store traffic. That means more people coming in, cross and upsell products. So if somebody comes in and buy bananas, can you also get them to buy a t-shirt and milk? Um, or you can get them to buy a brand where they make more pennies on the dollar. Can you improve customer experience where you keep that customer instead of having them going to a competitor? And can you improve the brand where people come in for more and more services, finance services, gas services, this kind of thing? One of the, the sort of directions 
that they went in uh, to do some of this type of work is retail-based healthcare. Now, for supermarket and grocery industry, their core business is food, right, and food-related products. And off that core business, so as an example, the Kroger company, they see about, I think, 11 to 14 million people a day. You can naturally sort of think, well, gee, these people need healthcare too. Let's offer them healthcare. And healthcare is a higher margin business. Um, so this was, uh, when I was looking at it, these were some data that basically showed what you see is an explosion of sites and the big retailers are really the ones that own these sites. It's almost always the parent company that owns the retail clinic, but you can see this growth and the growth is expected, was expected to continue. Um, at the time, there were lots of data suggesting people liked retail clinics. Uh, these are data from 2011 through 2015. And you can see in every age group, the number of retail clinic visits per 1,000 visits was going up. What were they delivering? And I can tell you in most cases, this hasn't changed at all. But really, flu and vaccinations, very simple. You saw this during the COVID pandemic. Uh, retailers are one of the most important uh, pieces of getting the population vaccinated quickly. Basic screening, cholesterol checks, weight checks, that kind of thing. Non-urgent conditions, otitis media, UTIs, bronchitis, that kind of thing. And then chronic disease management. So what they would say is chronic disease management is not really what we think of chronic disease management. They're not gonna handle a complex diabetic with renal failure and heart disease. But this could include maybe education, a simple blood check, that kind of thing, to sort of tell them that they have diabetes and where it is. So this is obviously important, and it's nice that they do these things, but obviously most of healthcare, most of the costs of healthcare are from a different population and from different types of conditions where it's much, much more complex. People need chronic follow-up. Now, this is what started to happen in a more sort of, in a bigger way. Now, there's been disruption for some time, but you may, may remember that Amazon bought Whole Foods. That really sent the industry uh, into a panic. Even story companies like Macy's were closing stores literally 100 at a time simply to sort of invest in their digital presence because they weren't getting foot traffic in anymore. Lots and lots of disruption. If you have an industry that's sort of really, really low margin, you bring in disruption, people are going to start looking for new things. So it was, there was a, a timing piece to this that I think allowed it to happen. And now you can obviously see, I mean, all the big retailers constantly in the headlines, whether it's CVS, Walgreens, Amazon, Walmart, Kroger, constantly in the space of getting into healthcare, pushing it in bigger and bigger ways. The number of acquisitions, the number of different types of business arrangements is, is enormous. When I looked at the space, there was really only, at that time, again, sort of going back 2014, 2015, a couple studies. If you went on clinicaltrials.gov, there was not a single trial being done by any retailer. Not a single one, anywhere in the world. There were two studies, which I call sort of simple studies, not really um, in their trials, but not in the sense where they really had to pull in a lot of store time or person time or much complexity to it, but very well done. One and the second one, both done with CVS Health. Uh, one was a behavioral economic uh, study looking at smoking cessation. The other one was looking at basically reminders on pill boxes where that improved medication adherence. But nothing in sort of a more rigorous trial way and certainly nothing getting at chronic disease. So um, I started looking for a retailer and basically for a strategy then. So the question was, what, what do you pitch? What makes sense? It's a time of disruption. You have an industry that even retail-based healthcare was pretty low margin. Many retail-based clinics were going out of business. They couldn't figure out what they were supposed to offer, who was going to pay for it, how much they were going to charge, the whole thing. Kroger uh, turned out to be right in our backyard. So they're headquartered in Cincinnati. Um, and they really... I think we're the ideal partner at the time. Uh, they've been the largest U.S. supermarket chain for a long time. As I mentioned, they're going to get even bigger with, if they acquire Albertsons. 
And they have a lot of infrastructure in place to do really interesting things. So they have an accessible and convenient physical store footprint, over 2,800 stores around the US. That's in 35 states, over 2,200 pharmacies. Full grocery inventory and pharmacy. I think CVS has a big, big disadvantage because they don't have the food. And food really brings people in in a big way. Uh, they have in-store professionals, not doctors. Walmart's bringing doctors in, but they did have dietitians, nurses, uh, medical assistants, and obviously pharmacists. They had a consumer-centric uh, model. They were going much more towards mobile. They're actually the biggest tech employer in Cincinnati. So realize retail, retail tech, these are both the hybrids. Is Amazon a retailer or is it a tech company? Is Kroger now a retailer or is it is the retail tech hybrid? They're all kind of the same. And then big data and analytics. They understand data as well as anyone. And um, they really, if you get coupons, if you get advertisements, uh, all these different things, that's comes from these amazing sort of data analytics centers that they have. So we went and we, th this, took, this took some time. <laughs> this was years of work to do this. But eventually what happened was we were able to meet with the leadership of Kroger and be able to pitch a vision where we would form a research partnership and we'd go after chronic diseases. That's where most of healthcare spending is. Um, the reality is retail was not set up yet to really treat chronic diseases. Um, we would focus on randomized clinical trials. The research in this space was pitiful, to say the least. Uh, if you looked at studies that have been done in retail, they would have lost the follow-up rates of 30%, 40%, non-randomized designs, you know, sample size of 40 or 50. I mean, really, really, none of them really having the evidence to sort of drive change or help understand how you deliver care in a retail-based environment. And so that led to really the third point, which was establishing new standards of conduct of these studies. And the plan was really to start building chronic disease interventions in multiple components. You know, I have to tell you, this, this, was, this was a little scary in the beginning. So there, there weren't any other studies out there. Um, it wasn't clear that we would be able to execute. It was, this, is, this is not like working with a pharmaceutical company where research is baked in, they're well-resourced, they have scientists, they have budgets, the whole thing. But we said, let's, let's focus on diet. That's your core business. You sell food. Once, let's study that, and then we maybe can add on a medication piece. So between diet and medications, you can get out a lot of things, high blood pressure, diabetes, all kinds of different conditions. Let's take the lessons of one trial cut the fat off the interventions, add on what we think really worked, and keep improving each component of the intervention uh, as we go forward. And then if you think about what you could add on next is monitoring. So if you want to go after things like heart failure, well, obviously diet's important, medications are important, but so is monitoring. Renal function, what's someone's weight? Are they getting symptomatic, are they not? Like These things together can all be done within a Kroger store within that physical environment, but the plan was to really sort of build it almost like Legos with one piece at a time. The, the question that we had at that time was also, what should this look like? The world doesn't want more fragmentation, right? They don't want a separate retail-based system and then a separate sort of traditional uh, system, right? With less communication, less coordination of anything. So we actually partner with our primary care network. They participate in CPC Plus. So Medicare and Medicaid have a value-based pilot program where basically these PCPs now get measured off value, which is outcomes divided by cost. So they love stuff that doesn't cost a lot but has a, makes a big, big difference. What are things like that? Better diet adherence better medication adherence, better screening rates, all these kinds of things. Um, so they were very, very much aligned with this type of partnership because these primary care docs all know that they can't change diet in a 15-minute visit. They all know it. There, there's not one person there that you're going to argue with that says that they can do it. They know they can't change medication adherence. 
So they're very much thinking like, why don't we focus on what we do well, but then have potentially an opportunity to work with a partner like Kroger right in people's communities, right where they're going two or three times a week anyway to actually do these things. And in some cases, it's probably going to be the better location for them to get it. What's the better place to learn about food? In a supermarket or in a sterile white doctor's office, right? So it makes sense. They were also innovating a lot as part of CPC Plus, trying to figure out how to improve outcomes but lower costs. Could some of those innovations that they were doing be put back into trials and be, and be tested? We also have access to a comprehensive payer database out of this. So we know all utilization, all costs to all the patients in the primary care network, which is really interesting. So as you build out a trials program, a testing program, you can start to understand if you compare intervention one versus intervention two, what's the utilization and costs? Right? Let's say you were to study a heart failure intervention. Who showed up to the hospital more? Right? The one that got the Kroger intervention, the one that didn't. Right? Which one reduced costs, which one didn't. And then also the PCP is obviously critically important because we wanted to improve recruitment, retention. It's always good to have people's primary care doc be a part of it. So let's talk a little about the Super One trial. And I'll, I'll take you through some specifics. Uh, some of the slides um, are there from my uh, late breaker talk. So this super one was the first late breaking clinical trial ever presented, sponsored by the retail industry. And my hope, my, my, my dream in 10 years is that when you go to the AHA or the ACC, you're gonna see as many trials sponsored by Amazon, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, as you do Pfizer, Medtronic, Abbott, and AstraZeneca. That's where we have to go and we have to bully it forward. So this was the first, um, you can see we went after diet. So super win was the acronym for it. It stands for supermarket and web-based intervention targeting nutrition. As you remember, the idea is to go and build really broad comprehensive interventions, but we had to start somewhere. Hadn't been done. Let's start with nutrition, food. That's the core business of this company. So, just to go through some of the slides, and I'll, I'll take you through some finer points as we go along. As you know, 75% Americans have poor dietary quality. It's really pretty abysmal if you look at the data. Um, the scientific world has been asking for this type of research for a long time. The AHA actually asked for immediate action on this, and there are three different areas where they asked for immediate action in 2019. So sponsor research with retailers, perfect. That's exactly what we're doing. Studies of online shopping. Online shopping had never been validated. Does online shopping actually improve the quality of the food that you eat for your home food environment? It was not known. The SNAP, or a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, what used to be called food stamps, was doing a study at that time to try to figure out whether people who have lower incomes can actually do better because they have higher obesity rates and higher chronic disease rates if you were to offer them online shopping and then studies of various nutrition applications. There are gazillions of them. So the reality is, could these actually help people? In my mind, if you just sort of change the environment, as I mentioned before, from what's there on the left to the right, you can make a big, big difference. So this was the design, and I'll walk you through it. So we took university-based primary care network patients. We wanted to show that you could actually integrate the two primary care docs taking care of their patients, but using community-based retail stores to actually deliver an intervention and had the whole thing integrated. These were adults. They had at least one cardiovascular risk factor. They shopped at a Kroger store. Uh, they were not an online shopper. We wanted to do the first test of whether online shopping works. And they were willing to follow the DASH diet. So DASH diet is one of the best empirically based uh, diets out there. It's a lot like the Mediterranean diet with like minor tweaks. We put them through a run-in and then basically all of the subsequent visits, everything was done right in the, in the uh, patient's home supermarket. So when we talk about decentralized trials, this is decentralization, big time. They never came to our university. They never came to any, their primary care network for any portion of this all run through the retail infrastructure. 
They got a medical nutrition therapy visit. That's standard of care. That's that one 30-minute visit that you send your patients to. Classically, does absolutely nothing. <laughs> I mean, if you, it's probably going to be delivered in my hospital each day. It's going to be delivered here each day. It doesn't really work. It's not sticky. It's 30 minutes, one time. You can't break people out of their behavior with that. But that's what we did at standard of care. And then we randomized people to no further intervention, where two different strategies where people came back for more educational visits in the store. We followed up at three months and at six months. And I'll take you through. So I mentioned we use the store. Um, so that was sort of new. That was an interesting experience. You have to get store managers on board. You have to find clinic space. I mean, it, the whole thing we did, you had to do from scratch. Plus, you have to train the staff. So we went through, this is one training session we did with the Kroger dietitians who are going to serve as our research coordinators, but it was everyone's first intro into research. Now, I can tell you, this is a wonderful group of healthcare professionals and some of the best dietitians I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I mean, really unbelievable quality dietitians, but we had to do it all from scratch. I mean, again, this is an industry that does not do research, that has not done trials. So it all had to be sort of done from the get-go. These were the three arms I mentioned. I'll take you through each one and show you some of the, the nuances, some of the things I think are just super cool. And I think it'll give you a sense of what you can do when you use some non-traditional partners. So maybe start to get you noodle on, noodling on things like what kind of data are out there? What kind of infrastructure out there? What kind of opportunities are there to study things that we can't do in a regular healthcare system? But just to start, here's the control group, strategy one and strategy two. So you can see control is the simplest, strategy three is the most complicated, and I'll walk you through. So let me show you this. So the medical nutrition therapy, we actually did a souped up version. Uh, this is uh, an analytics display that we created using Power BI. Awesome. Awesome. So before these participants showed up at their first medical nutrition therapy visit, we got dietary info off them, and they reviewed their own dietary intake with the dietitian to really go over what was going right, what was going wrong. So if you look here, we could calculate how much on average they were eating in terms of calories, sodium, saturated fat, whether specific foods they were eating were DASH friendly or no. Calculate, DASH is basically a diet where you have to eat certain types of food groups. There are nine of them. And you have to eat lots of the good stuff, like fruits and vegetables, and try and hit your targets. And you try to stay below certain thresholds for things like meats, oil, sugar, salt, salt, that kind of thing. But you can see here, average daily servings. So look at this person. This is an actual real participant. Fruits, half a serving a day. The goal was three, right? Vegetables, goal was three person was eating around two, but you can see most of it was red or dash unfriendly. So this could be something that was really, really salted or something that's super fatty, that kind of thing, didn't meet dash friendliness. And you can see as most Americans, meat, poultry, seafood was above it, fats and oils were above it, sweets were above it. I mean, this is typical. If you look across participants, almost everyone's eating this way. So really, really interesting. And then you can see down here below the specific items captured that were analyzed to make this. But this changes everything when someone is looking at this, right? I mean, it just cuts through the fat of what is someone actually eating. And we actually had additional information a dietitian could look at is where are these foods being eaten? So you could see what was someone eating at what time of day? So you could figure out, are they eating breakfast in the car? Are they eating breakfast at home? Are they stopping at Mickey D's? What are they doing? But it gives the dietitian a way to actually talk to the participant and just understand where changes should be made. If someone's too busy to make breakfast at home, then you have to figure out what can I help them get in the car? What's healthy so they don't stop through the drive through So this is kind of, it's kind of like precision medicine, but with when it comes to diet. So really, really cool, could easily be replicated. Thank you through this. So this was something that we used just to go back for both of these strategies that we tested. And we created this from scratch. So if you think about retail, you've been giving your purchasing data to them for decades. They sell you stuff using it, right? 
couldn't we potentially repurpose that for health? Only little bits of work have been done on us, but nobody has done really robust work on it. These data were never actually set up for healthcare purposes. Fascinating experience working with these data. When we started, I mean, things have become like a long way since we started, but there were challenges using it, but the things that we could do in a valid way, I sort of show you here. So this would be a participant who would come in, one of these visits, and you could see for a specific dash group, what they were spending, and you could see what they were spending over time, whether they were buying canned, fresh, frozen, the whole works, and then what they were actually buying. So this is a great thing if you're trying to think about how to help someone save money, if you're trying to help someone do recipe building, if you're trying to make better suggestions to a, uh, a participant about what to try next to get more fruits and vegetables into their diet, if you know what they're already buying, that's great. Also realize people live in a home food environment, right? So my wife buys more snacks than I do. I try to buy, buy no snacks. She buys the snacks, I raid the snacks. So that's a problem. But this actually cuts into that so the dietitian can see what's getting into the home food environment because the problem may not be with what the person is buying, but what their spouse or someone else is buying. And so you can see the level of insight. And what's amazing about purchasing data is it's automatically electronically collected. So in this study for the people coming in and, and these strategies, this was updated every 24 hours at midnight. You could stop in any day of the week and see your purchasing data. And you would review it with the dietitian, and the dietitian could then use it to guide your care plan and what to do next. So pretty cool. I'll show you a little bit of this. They use this purchasing data in these two arms to guide in-store tours. So this, this is, I mean, the, the data is really cool, but the in-store tours are really kind of what I think are the magic. So this is Elizabeth. She's an unbelievable dietitian. She's walking. We had to do all these mock visits, you know. So this was a business, business school student I was mentoring at the time, but we were doing mock visits. Again, that research training, we had to do a lot of training to like really make sure this trial was going to run well. But we did every visit. They did label reading, all kinds of stuff, set goals, action plans. But why these dietitians matter, and it's, a, and it's a key point for thinking about other industries, is they are better than our UC dietitians. You know why? Because they know the full food inventory of Kroger. So it's like they have this laboratory that at their disposal. They work in the store, but they know the 70,000 products on the shelf. So if you want to eat less meat and try more sort of meat alternatives, right? They know that the 32 brands on the shelf, which ones are gross and which one is a hit. They know the mouthfeel. They know what customers think about them. So when they make a suggestion, let's say you want to eat less meat and try to meet alternative, they know which one to tell you to use. That's the magic there. Right? It's not just simply telling someone to eat more of a DASH diet and people go around and they fumble around in the supermarket. They can actually make more targeted suggestions that are more likely to have you adopt them. And the same thing for that person who basically like doesn't have a lot of time and the dietitian sort of knew this, they can suggest things that are already prepared, already packaged, fruits and vegetables that are already sort of cut up and placed, things that we don't even sort of think about or we blow by they can actually know those things and can directly solve problems right there. It's really, really cool when you see it happening. And then I'll, strategy uh, two, strategy two was the one that compared to strategy one added on a stepwise introduction to online shopping with home delivery or pickup and then nutrition apps. So basically the first test of online shopping and whether it works. So we tested, so by definition, in order to run this trial, we had to use people who had not online shopped before. So there's like a, a clock on this. Everyone has online shopped, right? So like the window for doing this was you know, coming to an end because people are, have used these technologies so much. But we found a group that had not done it. And if you think about who those people are, these are probably people who are resistant to online shopping, right? If you haven't used it for the first five years, you're probably not so game to do it. 
So we walked them through it in a stepwise way. So we taught them how to use Kroger.com, which is the main website. There is a version on the app. Some people like websites, some people like apps. We had to partner with a separate company. They're a last mile delivery company called Grocery Runners to do the delivery piece. N none of the stuff was sort of set up with the company yet. So we had to like build it ourselves. Um, Kroger came up with an app to help people uh, select better foods. So if you're eating Frosted Flakes and you love Frosted Flakes, you can put Frosted Flakes in there and basically it will give you a, a better version of Frosted Flakes that probably meets your taste preferences, but it's also healthier. So they, they have this app that does that. And then we introduced them to Yumly, which is basically the world's best way to build recipes. You can type in anything in there. I mean, if you want to eat Cantonese, all vegetables, low sodium, whatever it is, they will show you 100 recipes on how to do that and provide you the shopping list. Isn't that awesome? Because the dietitian already knows what you're buying. So they can actually play together and sort of see what recipes could you build off what your family likes and what you're already buying. So really, really interesting, but we walked them through in a stepwise way. We did two formal tests, as I mentioned. Um, research in this space was really, really primitive. It wasn't really high science. So we did two tests. What was the efficacy of the data-guided in-store teaching sessions versus control? And then hierarchically, if we hit on that, what was the efficacy of online shopping nutrition apps? Primary endpoint was DASH score. It's a continuous variable. 90 is perfect adherence to the DASH diet. Zero is no adherence. Basically, the higher the score, the greater the adherence. Now, COVID hit us right in the middle of this. We got through COVID. Pretty, br pretty brutal, but very tough to run a supermarket-based study in the, in the height of the pandemic. Baseline characteristics, um, and I'll get into the results here. Basically, the age, middle age, mostly women and a largely primary care prevention population. If you all are trialists, you know the primary care prevention trials are much harder to do than secondary prevention because people aren't that sick yet. This is an important sort of result slide. So before COVID hit us, these were our visit attendance rates in both arms. That's pretty amazing. Uh, so this hasn't been shown before. If you look at the best trials, visit attendance is around 75, 80%. We were batting near 100%. And I think this speaks to the fact that if you can deliver it right in their home store where they're going normally, and you can do it with a retail-based provider where they have a really customer-centric culture, and you can make the interventions fun with all the stuff I showed you and feel like they're effective, you can really, really do well. So I think this is... It's a big signal for like, how do you do trials in free living community-based populations? Post-COVID, it went down, but this was largely not a fall of the trial. This was people were worried they were gonna bring COVID back to grandma or their kids or someone else. So these are the results. So if you look at control, strategy one, strategy two, from baseline to three months, DASH went up in each one in almost a stepwise way. These are good changes, and they're all clinically significant. And in the first test, we found that actually these data-guided in-store tours worked. They were better than control. And then we actually validated that if you just add the online shopping nutrition apps piece to it on top, that also works. So a big, big uh, change. What's interesting is that six months, this was after the intervention was done, all three groups we're still eating better than they were at baseline. What's interesting is I told you that a normal medical nutrition therapy visit done through a traditional system actually doesn't have any effect, really, at three months. So here we were seeing an effect of our control at six months still. So it suggests that we probably should have had a control through our regular system. We sort of you know, hamstrung ourselves a little bit on that, but anyway, quite interesting. The between group differences weren't the same, weren't any different. So basically, the summary was DASH adherence increased in every group at three and six months. Um, I wish we could have done one year because some of those groups might have even stayed elevated at one year. That's kind of the holy grail. The interventions we delivered using the store's physical environment, dietitians, purchasing data worked. So did the online shopping. Uh, 
There was near perfect visit attendance, which I think is really interesting. It shows that we can run trials through these groups. And it was also a demonstration that we can form these types of academic retail collaborations for enough years to actually get a trial done, which is, which is key. There have been attempts in the past, but they've sort of collapsed halfway in between. It took about five years. So let me talk a little bit about, so the response to the late breaker was, was big. And the reason it matters is it's important for the industry to get a sense that people care about this. If you're a new entrant into it, they want to see the press, they want to see that people care, that there's excitement, that other types of traditional healthcare stakeholders have an interest. Uh, three papers have been published so far, design paper, our primary results in Nature Medicine, nice review by the Duke Clinical Research Institute. And um, we were actually, the results were presented uh, to the Biden White House uh, by Kroger CEO. It's been highly influential on the C-suite of the company, and they've started building out their research program now. They've started making investments in research and hiring more people. When we started, there was not one research program person in the entire company. This type of trial has now led to this starting to grow. And they've even entered in the, the clinical trials business, the idea that they would sort of maybe support pharma with their trials, serve as a site, maybe serve as a data source for clinical trials. So really interesting. And now, as I sort of you know, take you back to where we were before, we're now ready to do trial two. So let's, let's try to fix that medication adherence problem that we have out there and medication titration problem and pair it to a new improved dietary intervention here and go after conditions like diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. So it's the natural sort of evolution to sort of building it out. So the final thoughts are, um, for those in the room, a lot more doors have to be opened. There is still today no trials on clinicaltrials.gov with any of these big entrants coming in, none, none. So I know Superwind 2 is going to be the, the next one on there. It is, it is, it's a tough slog, but there are lots of opportunities. And I throw out three companies that I think are prime for this. Walmart. Walmart's really interesting. So their business model, not to get into it, but they're building clinics on their sort of physical sites that are going to have doctors, x-ray rooms, full-service labs, the works, even dentists. You can do a lot more if you have a doc on site and you have that type of equipment. Uber, how do you get patients to appointment? Massive issue. Mass, how do you get people pills? I mean, how do you do all this stuff? Massive opportunity there. Anytime fitness. Anytime fitness is right in your backyard. They're owned by self-esteem brands. They're headquartered in Woodbury. Um, and they have around 4,700 locations uh, on the planet. I think they're a massive opportunity to rethink how we do things like cardiac rehab in a big, big way. So I actually came here during COVID, uh, met with Dave Mortensen. He's the president um, and founder of Self Esteem Brands. Um, really interesting discussion. And uh, all I ask is if one of you decides to chase this idea, just put me on your steering committee somewhere. But, but, but it is cool. I mean, think about what problems we have with cardiac rehab. You have to come to a physical location in a traditional system. It's open nine to five. Well, what are you supposed to do? Take off work? 36 sessions or 72 sessions? Um, it's inconvenient. Oftentimes, it's not an attractive place to come. Um, and it's not the place where you're going to go after you finish the rehab. So what was nice about the Kroger study? Yeah, is, is you got the trial in the same place we're going to shop afterwards. So you can get that stickiness, right? So the goal with diet is to have adherence one year out. Well, if people go back to the same environment, they, they were taught how to do things well, chances are you're going to get it. Same thing if you could actually deliver a rehab in a place where people could go and exercise and maintain their fitness afterwards anyway. So the same kind of principle here. So if you think about cardiac patients in the healthcare system, you could push them out and deliver rehab programs in a place like Anytime Fitness. They have 24-7 access. I can tell you I'll never do cardiac rehab if it's 9 to 5. Too busy. If you could make it at night, make it on the weekends, I could do it. There are 4,700 locations. They have physical therapists on site. They actually have trained professionals that could do real administration of programs. They have all the equipment you need. 
And we actually brought um, a company called Include Health that has unbelievable technology to connect the healthcare provider that would sit in a place like Minneapolis Heart and direct the cardiac rehab program delivered at the Anytime Fitness. And all that data could be fed back, even from the very machines. Someone's doing leg extensions, they'll tell you how many extensions, what weight, full range of motion, not all this kind of stuff. It's unbelievable what you can do, but you could run it all through there and you could actually follow them post rehab program. Because what happens to our patients? They attend the rehab program and then things go back to normal. But you could actually potentially change this. I can tell you there's a real interest there because the fitness industry is a little bit like the supermarket industry. They're looking for opportunities that are higher margin. COVID shook them because when COVID came, basically people canceled their gym memberships. That's where, that's where they're getting the money. So their companies like Gold Gym actually went bankrupt. This could be something that's really interesting and you've got a partner right in town that I think could be really interested in this. So I'll leave it there, but I think this is where healthcare has to go. For rehab, as an example, this would be more convenient, more accessible, probably get you persistence and probably be a lot more fun for the patients. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah, we can open it up for questions. John will monitor the online. <clears throat> Congratulations on your non-traditional thinking and perseverance and for getting a study that has a lot of women in, the, in it. Yep. <laughs> um, yes. I wonder if you see any opportunity to link this data that the grocery stores have on what you purchase with outcomes in the, in the, in the health care records, in other words. Oh, right? sure. Oh, you better believe it. Yeah, they'll, they'll, there will probably be a time point when um, people's purchasing data can is fed into the electronic health record. And, and just more directly, when other data from the retail environment get fed into the electronic health record, which I think would be amazing if you were a primary care doc to know how are people doing, the diabetic patient, and the reality is how are they eating, what are they purchasing, what's happening in and out of your clinic. But yes, yes, people are, people are working on that. The, it is still, use of purchasing data is, is complicated. I, I had to learn a lot about it. Um, and it's never been designed for healthcare purposes, but it could be. So as an example, when, when I started with Kroger, probably about 10% of the, uh, the SKU codes or the actual items in the store were linked to nutrition data. That's now gone up to about 70, 80, 90%. So you could start to get real data from purchases and things like that that could be fed in. I don't think anyone's doing anything like that yet, but it, it'll come. I'm just wondering, you know, when you show this, in, what you showed with the DASH diet, which is quite remarkable, to then show, okay, did this change their body mass index or did it change their blood pressure? Because it looked like your average BMI was... They were all obese. The average was obese over 30. It looked to me yeah. like. And, uh, yeah, so we, we, we collected those data. The challenge with this was that this was a tough trial to do. Yeah. Um, in terms of the amount of funding we had from the sponsor, but then also just like the risk. I mean, I mean, just even getting a contract done. I mean, we had 11 contracts for this. I mean, we're sending data at different places and all the stuff that happened. Um, so we. I sort of defocused on measuring a lot of the clinical outcomes during it. Now, there were signals that we probably did lower blood pressure and that we lowered weight and so forth, but we didn't capture them in as rigorous a way at that. Now, retrospectively, now that it went well, I, I wish we would have done. Um, but yeah, that, 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 in the next trial, we will know all that for sure, 100%. And we'll, we'll, we'll probably have that out to a year at least because it's quite clear that we're, we're getting stickier results than what have been seen before. And if we have stickier results, then chances are we can hit those outcomes that take a little bit longer to modify than just dietary intake. I think a great presentation. And I think the question that uh, arises in my mind is how does a retail company uh, like Collier profit out of this type of Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. I think the question that rises in my mind is how do they profit from that? Because you're getting sponsored by a company that sells products, right? right. And they want their customers to buy products. So you do a diet intervention. I, well, in my mind, when I diet, I spend less actually because I buy less. And I think that if you're obese, you're going to go there and buy more things. And how do they profit for it from a diet yeah. intervention? Yeah, so. Um, so the way I think about this industry is you think about same store sales <laughs> as how they sort of measure it year to year. That's real the measure in the industry. If you think about your food budget, what proportion do you actually spend in the grocery store? Most Americans are spending the minority of their dollars in the grocery store. They're spending it at other places like restaurants, hospital cafeterias, all kinds of places like that. If you can create interventions that actually help people and satisfy more of their sort of needs, um, you can get a higher proportion of their overall food budget, right? Um, so if you're spending $100 and right now you're spending 70 out of the $100 outside of a, a supermarket, if they could push that up to be you know, only $60, what we know for sure is that your diet will go in the right direction. Every dollar that you spend that's spent in a supermarket on average is going to be healthier than a dollar that you spend outside. And you're also going to save money. So shifting people to a place where they actually get more value for their dollar. So one thing is they don't have to, it's more about having you come back uh, more frequently to keeping you loyal and to getting a higher proportion of your food budget because right now they know increasingly Americans are spending more and more of their food budget outside of supermarkets to begin with, which is one of the big problems. They're stopping at KFC on the way home. Big, big problem. All these different businesses are pulling your food budget away. The other thing is that the reality is if you can actually deliver good health care in there, there's massive money to be made. Massive money. I mean, very different. I mean, right now, if Kroger sells you a can of Coke, they make one penny on that. So, right, the margins are tiny. Healthcare is very, very different than that. So they can actually offer great health care to be covered by insurers, where insurers say, yeah, this really works. Employers, insurers, others would send their patients over. That, that's their economic win. It makes it really sustainable. And what's nice about this industry is they scale fast. When I started with Kroger, they had, didn't have online shopping anywhere. They were testing at one store in Denver. By the time we started Super Win, they had it in 1,200 stores. So when they go, they go very quickly. And that's the hope here. We can do things to actually help people, save them money, improve their health, the whole thing. Kroger gets an advantage from it, and then they just scale it. Now we have a real public health intervention that actually has an economic engine to maintain it. That it actually exists in the world, not just now, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the line. But it's a, it's a very, very good question. The reality is it's about more shopping, higher proportion of food budget, and then the actual dollars that would come from healthcare delivery. Same way, you know, this institution is focused on healthcare delivery. Good question. I'm just curious, did Kroger measure that in the study? Did they see in this in this population uh, the margins go up or you know, bringing those people in, as you said, did they look at that? Um, well, they didn't. Uh, we haven't as the, as okay. the scientific group. It's, it's a good question. I have all the personal data. Yeah. Life has just gotten so busy. Uh, yeah, I, I, need, I need some good fellows and uh, research scientists to help me. Chug through, chug through some of these data. <laughs> but it's, it's a very good question. The early signals are, are, are probably there. And just think about the branding, right? This was an intervention for adults. But what about kids, right? It's one of the saddest things, childhood obesity. I mean, it's like, it's, just, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's terrible. They could actually do, we could do the same interventions to help parents not make the same mistake for their kids and get their kids off to a better start in life. Think about the branding around that. 
right? America's number one supermarket chain helping American, youngest Americans get off the best start in life. All this kind of stuff. So the reality is a lot of things are going wrong there. They could get a lot of credit from, I think, the public for like taking a real push into the space. I think we have a question online. Yeah, we do. Thank you, Dr. Steen, for your presentation. Um, so the question comes from Barb, and the question is, was there any uh, resistance by participants to having their data, such as preferences, buying habits, uh, et cetera, in a database? Uh, she goes on to ask, were there any disincentives in the study to still buy those frosted flakes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the, the data that we showed were already being captured, right? So the, these were Kroger shoppers, so these, the, the data already existed in the database. For sure, I mean, we, we didn't sort of collect any new data in terms of purchasing data that, that weren't already there. What we did was actually used it to give value to the actual person doing shopping. Right now you give your data, and those data are just used to sell you product. That's it. So we actually gonna give you back your data to actually help. And what's, what's really nice is that it really helped the dietitian provide a better experience for the uh, participant. So maybe there could have been some resistance. I, I, I don't know. Uh, certainly everyone who was randomized in the trial uh, had to be comfortable with that. Um, there weren't any formal disincentives for buying you know, bad products. Um, certainly a dietitian would f sort of focus on, obviously, uh, the good products to encourage them, but then sort of you know, identify what are the bad products, why are they getting into the household. Birthday cake, why, why is that there? Oh, you know, my five-year-old had a birthday, okay. It would lead to those kinds of discussions to understand what was happening in the home food environment. Um, but then opportunities to shift people over uh, to a better product, healthier product, but that would taste good as well. So, but no formal disincentive. No one got a financial or monetary uh, disincentive or anything like that. I have a question around recruitment, so I'm sure. going to think about High Enroll. So I know High Enroll has some patient-facing app that's kind of hot off the press. How did you do recruitment for this, and would you envision in the future using some of that technology for that you have? Yeah, High so, so so it's great. So this great question uh, for this. These were UC Health primary care network patients. So we used Epic's My Chart. Epic is our electronic health record, so we could get directly to them. And then we sent uh, paper mailings and we did some calls, that kind of thing. We got some referrals in from the PCPs, but we found that the PCPs were largely sending us their uh, disaster patients. The referrals would be the person who PCP is out of options, can't get the patient, take a single medication for 20 years, follow a single diet, show up at any appointment, they'd be like, well, let's send them to this study, the study will fix them. <laughs> Obviously not exactly the person we're looking for a, for a trial. But yeah, high enroll wasn't wasn't available at the time. But yes, there will be um, a product high enroll that basically helps healthcare providers understand what studies going on, um, and helps the participants understand what studies going along, and helps them share with their uh, spouses and loved ones. Um, yeah, for for sure. And I can tell you, I, I can't talk about it, but there'll be some, some exciting things between high enroll and retail in the future. I think. Any last minute burning questions? Otherwise, we are going to have a lunch and learn back here in the Learning Center if you want to hear more about high enroll. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Steve.